Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good morning. So, so good to see you all and welcome you to the first class of adult ed for this season. It's, it's like the first day of school around here today. So it's nice to have you here. Um, I'm Betsy Storm and I'm on the adult ed committee and we are, um, we are very excited and I'll be reintroducing Vicki Curtis, who many of you know already, but first just want to tell you quickly a little bit about two upcoming classes. Um, our class is three weeks, and then the Foundations of Islam, uh, subtitled Discovering Common Ground and Debunking the Myths, uh, is in, on Sundays, October 1, 8, and 15, and then uh, following that, on October 22nd, 29th, and November 5th, we'll be having a three-week class on gun violence, advocacy and uh, policy, leadership, all kinds of things. It should be a really, really great class. Um, but for today, we're going to be focused on our first Celtic spirituality class. And first, I'd like to begin um, with a Celtic prayer. So please pray with me. You are the peace of all things calm. You are the place to hide from harm. You are the light that shines in dark. You are the heart's eternal spark. You are the door that's open wide. You are the guest who waits inside. You're the stranger at the door. You're the calling of the poor. You are my Lord and with me still. You are my love, keep me from ill. You are the light, the truth, the way. You are my savior this very day. Amen. So I am, um, I'm gonna say something I've never said before. You hear people say it all the time, but I think our speaker today needs no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and we are thrilled to welcome her back to fourth. Vicki Curtis has been a Presbyterian minister since 1980, serving as co-pastor or interim of churches around the country, as well as an executive presbyter in Western Reserve, Ohio. She was associate pastor for mission here at Forth for 12 years, four of which she was also executive director of Chicago Lights. Vicki is currently the program director for the Siena Retreat Center in Racine, Wisconsin where she offers individuals spiritual direction, leads retreats, and plans for their year-long offerings. Vicki has been a spiritual director for more than 40 years and teaches congregations how to engage in communal discernment. So come on up here, Vicki. All right. <laughs> well, it's so wonderful to be back. I retired from Forth during COVID, so I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to people in person. So it's nice to be able to say hello in person. <laughs> um, that was in, I left in May of uh, 2020, and I want to dedicate this class to Marsha Heiser and Kent Organ, my late husband, because both of them were co-leaders with me on the fourth church pilgrimage to Iona in 2017. And I was, as I was preparing for this, I just kept thinking about both of them and the wonderful memories that I have from our time together. I'm sorry for the people on Zoom that I wasn't thinking, I was kind of old school about using handouts instead of PowerPoint. <laughs> so. If you all um, want that, Jane um, can email you the handouts. That would be great. We're going to have more handouts today than probably either of the next two classes. What interests me most about uh, Celtic Christianity is its theology and spiritual content. But we're going to save most of that for the second and third classes because today we're going to do the when and who and where were the Celts. And that's a lot more data, so that's why we have the handouts. Um, 
I have also placed in the back of the room some pieces, uh, some fabric, some needlepoint, some carved pieces, some jewelry that show the unique, distinctive Celtic art, which you can immediately identify when it has interlocking shapes. So make sure you have a, a, a look after the class at that, but I'll bring that back each week as well. So there's gonna be a lot of, my preferred way of teaching is interactive, but because of the content for today, it's mostly gonna be presentation, but please do raise your hand if you can't hear me or if you don't understand what I'm saying or if you have a question about something, I'll, I'll do my best to try to answer that. So Celtic, which is mispronounced for one of our basketball teams, <laughs> singles, signals languages that are a, a particular grouping of people, um, not a racial, ethnic connotation, but a linguistic connotation. It signifies both the areas where Celtic languages were and are spoken, and the culturally formed spiritualities, historical and contemporary, that are linked to those languages. Celtic is derived from the Greek word Keltoi, which was used to name the peoples who lived on the fringes of Europe in ancient times. One place I read that the same root is used for kilt and means hidden. So some have said because there was a strong oral tradition but not written tradition among the Celts, their wisdom was more hidden. I don't know if that's true or not. But the areas which we now know as Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Brittany, Cornwall, the Isle of Man, and Galicia in Spain are where the Celtic peoples eventually were pushed toward. So let's take a look at your map to get a sense, and again, the period of time that we're talking about is primarily between the 5th and 9th centuries BC. So things like England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland were not known in that time. Instead, you see on these maps the kingdoms of various tribes in the upper, the way Western Europe looked in the early 6th century. And then down below are cities that were important centers of the Irish Christian influence. So you see the word Irish there. Ireland was the one place that you sometimes hear it referred to as continental Christianity, sometimes as the Roman stream of Christianity, but Ireland was, I don't wanna say the word immune because that sounds like the other was a disease, but it was, <laughs> it was um, separate from that influence. So when we talk about Celtic Christianity, and I'll go into more detail about this later on, um, there were various times, the, there was a single Christian church until the Eastern Orthodox split around 1056, and then later the Reformation around 1565. And so even though now when we hear St. Patrick or St. Columba, we might think Catholic, it was not that distinction at the time that they were missionaries. There was one church, but as we'll see later, we're, we'll talk about how there were two streams of spirituality, the Mediterranean or the continental, 
and then um, the Celtic. So at the beginning of the Christian epoch, the Celtic people were spread across the northern boundaries of the Roman Empire in a geographic arc. And at the eastern end of the arc in Asia Minor lay Galatia, and at the western end of the arc lay Ireland. The only Celtic territory untouched, that's the word we'll use, untouched by the imperial armies of Rome. And in between lay the partially conquered island of Britain, the annexation of which commenced in 43 AD. And on the mainland lay Gaul, conquered for Rome in 51 BC by Julius Caesar. By the end of the first thousand years of the Christian epoch, the Celtic territories had been greatly reduced. Isolated pockets were quickly swamped or taken over. Galatia, while still speaking a recognizable Celtic language in the fifth century AD, had virtually disappeared by the sixth century. The great mass of Celtic Gaul, which had consisted not only of the territories of modern France, but also Belgium and parts of Germany and Switzerland, had succumbed to conquest. In the island of Britain, the invasions of the Anglo-Saxons pushed the Celtic inhabitants into the Western peninsulas and the north of the island to form the nations of Cornwall, Wales, and Scotland. So on your map again, if you see where, uh, well, the top map, the Picts, P-I-C-T-S, is a population that's now what we consider Scotland. Ireland has the name it still has. Wales is not mar demarcated there, but would be in south of where it says the Britons. And then there are those tiny little islands up by the Picts, including Iona. The Celts were first called the hidden people because of their reluctance to commit their language, their, their knowledge and scholarship to written records. Um, each of these traditions has its own distinct characteristics. And I think it's important for us to remember this I'll be teaching Celtic Christianity as if it's one thing. But if you think about it, that would be like wiping out all the Protestant denominations in the United States and just saying what the Protestant spirituality is. When we know, at least members of our congregation, if they were to go to a fundamentalist Pentecostal church that where the people speak in tongues during worship, we may not feel like we have a lot of affinity with them. So I don't think there may be drastic changes within the continuum of Christian, um, Celtic Christianity, but the cultural context for various regions probably added their own flavor to how it was expressed. So from Ireland, we receive prayers and poems marked by lyric qualities, both in the texts from the monastic and hermetic traditions and in the texts from the oral tradition. From the Outer Hebrides of Scotland, a robust oral tradition, and also songs and prayers that reflect an intimate awareness of God's presence in every moment and in every aspect of life. And we'll see this next week, especially we're gonna look at some of the prayers, ancient prayers that were orally passed on and their prayers for while you're milking a cow or you're <laughs> preparing the, the hearth or for every little part of your day, they would, they would have prayers. So this lively Scottish tradition continues in the present day through the liturgies, hymns, and prayers published by the Iona community. And their islands were inhabited by vigorous, passionate, imaginative, colorful people who loved poetry and music and were deeply religious. 
Now I'm gonna talk about pre-Christian Celtic society and religion because that is the context that the Christianity uh, entered and as we know, the cultural context has a great influence on the particular emphases that theology or spirituality uh, embrace. So language was not the only thing that united the Celts. Religion was a cornerstone of their world. The Celtic religion, remember we're talking about pre-Christian, was promulgated by Druids. The word Druid came from Druvid, meaning thorough knowledge. And the Druids fulfilled both religious and political functions. There was no separation of church and state. Anyone in the tribe could undertake the strenuous training required to qualify. Their function was as a minister of the religion, which had a complete doctrine of immortality and a moral system widespread among the Celtic peoples, but they were also philosophers, teachers, and natural scientists, often called upon to give legal, political, and military judgments. The Druids were trained in international law as well as tribal law and were arbiters in disputes between territorial groups. So I, I'm afraid I had a um, stereotyped image of what a Druid would look like which was short and green. <laughs> but that's probably neither true. When you, when, when you hear about the role that they played in society, you know, it was, um, it was very prominent. The Celtic re religion was one of the first to evolve a doctrine of immortality. The Druids taught that death is only a changing of place and that life goes on with all its forms and goods in another world. So you could see how the Christian doctrine of resurrection would not be too difficult for them to embrace. For the Druids, it was a world of the dead which also gives up living souls. So there was a constant exchange of souls that took place between the two worlds. Death in this world, bringing a soul to the other, and then death in the other world that would bring a um, birth of a soul to this world. And, though, and so one could see Celts celebrating birth with mourning and death with joy. The Druids also taught the indestructibility of the material universe. Another way of saying that that's more current language would be, nothing is lost. Celtic philosophies were highly regarded. Aristotle, Sotian, and Clement of Alexandria all state that the early Greek philosophers borrowed much of their philosophy from the Celts. The Druids remind one of Buddhist monks of the Zen masters. They dwelt in firm communion with nature, and they believed in the consciousness of all things. Trees, fountains, rivers, even the weapons and the implements they used were considered possessed of an indwelling spirit. We'll come back to that because some New Age people have been attracted to Celtic spirituality with the sense that spirit is immersed in nature in all aspects of the universe or the cosmos. But it's important to distinguish, even Matthew Fox borders, who's a contemporary Christian, I think he got booted out of the Catholic Church by the Pope, but creation-centered theologian that one can say nature is a manifestation of God um, and nature is in God, but that's different from saying that God is in nature. So 
God is beyond nature, not contained by nature, if you can sense a difference. The Celts believed in the plurality of gods. Uh, their gods were basically ancient heroes and the ancestors of the people rather than their creators. Celtic mythology is filled with heroic legends. For the Celts made their heroes into gods and their gods into heroes. The Celtic hero and heroine had to have intellectual attributes equal to their physical capabilities. They were totally human and were subject to all the natural virtues and vices. So it, you know, it would maybe take a, a little brain warp for us to think about a god who also has a whole lot of vices, but they, they didn't have a problem with that. So a happy spirit pervaded the majority of the gods, although there were a few, a variety of minor evil spirits. The Celtic calendar or year was made up of festivals that connected to their environment as well as a religious outlook. And calendrical record was important in Celtic society. Caesar said of the Druids, they have much to say about the stars and their motions, about the magnitude of the heavens and the earth, about the construction of nature, about the power and authority of the immortal gods. And this they communicate to their pupils. So Druids were regarded as great natural scientists who had a knowledge of physics and astronomy applied in the construction of calendars. So I could have given you another handout with the four major religious festivals, but the first is Samhain, which starts on the evening of October 31st, All Hallows' Eve, and continues through November 1st. It marks the end of one pastoral year and the beginning of the next. And it was also the time when in the Celtic other world would be visible to this world. And when that passage of souls back and forth or other spiritual forces were let loose. So Samhain um, later was adapted by Christianity into a harvest festival. And the animals that were previously sacrificed to Bel, B-E-L, were now offered to St. Martin. And the feast beca became St. Martin's Mass, also known as All Saints Day or All Hallows Day. So here you see the first of several adaptations that Christianity made with the previous uh, cultural and religious festivals. And we, this has happened all over the world. Christmas itself was an adaptation from solstice. The next great festival occurs on February 1st, which was the feast day of a Celtic goddess known as Bridget in Ireland. I'm going to send around a painting of Bridget, which um, we'll talk more about her as we go along, but this w painting was done by Jan John Dankin, and it shows her, who painted it uh, probably in the late 1800s. I love it because, as you'll learn as we go along, she's being carried by angels, and accompanying her are the sea otters on, in the waves and birds in the air, the animal world is very much a part of her, um, her adventure. Sure. It, you can see that painting in Glasgow or Edinburgh. I'm not remembering which one. Before she was embraced as St. Bridget in Christianity, she was revered as the goddess of fertility, and her feast was connected with the coming into milk of the ewes 
and was therefore a pastoral festival. Bridget, the goddess of fertility, then merged with the image of Saint Bridget, who founded the Christian monastery of Kildare in the sixth century BC, and then February 1st became her feast day. We'll come back to this later, but one of the reasons I love Celtic Christianity is that women had a much more uh, equal partnership in leadership with men than in the continental Christian stream. It wasn't full, but you found women as nuns, as uh, founders of monasteries, as teachers, as saints, just alongside the men. So Bridget is a prominent one of those. The third festival is the Feast of Beltane on May 1st, and that name derives from the Fires of Bell, and in Scotland, May Day was known as the Day of the Yellow Fires of Bell. And this was the day when the Celts offered praise to Bell, the god of sun and the life giver, for having brought victory over the powers of darkness and bringing the people within sight of another harvest. So Beltane also was claimed by Christianity and for a time merged with the feast day of St. John the Baptist. And the last ceremony of the year was the Feast of Lugnasa on August 1st. It was named after the Celtic god Lug, I think I'm pronouncing that right, and was basically an agrarian feast in honor of the harvesting of crops, and the celebration usually lasted 15 days. August is still called Lugnasa in Irish, and the festival has become the traditional Christian harvest festival. So as I said, it was not unusual for the early Christians to seize on pagan festivals and convert them to their own cause. Like we know, Christmas on December 25th was not celebrated as a, in the Christian calendar until after 200 AD. And it originally derived from the Roman feast of Saturnalia. Easter in England derived from the April festival of Astra, goddess of dawn, and in England, the week is made up primarily of pre-Christian English gods' names, which I'm going to butcher, unfortunately, but the moon's day, Tiu's day, capital T-I-U, name of a god, Woden's day, Thuner's day, Frigg's day, Saturn's day, and the sun's day. So the early Christians did what they did, and we now have the ways we call it. The Celts had a special regard for the Trinity, and the mystical number of three, the number three permeates Celtic mythology and art. The Druids taught in the form of triads, sentences of three phrases, and held the number three to be mystical. And it may be perhaps to this pre-Christian Celtic tradition of the Trinity that the Holy Trinity achieved a very prominent position in Celtic symbolism and in their prayers. And we'll see this when we look at the prayers. The Trinity is very prominent. The Celts, at a very early stage of their civilization, developed a medical service, a European-renowned surgery system, and prototype health service, which was made available to everyone. Under Celtic law, universal health care, huh? the responsibility for providing for the sick, wounded, and mentally handicapped was in the hands of the tribe, and it was a tribe, was, um, Populations were organized in tribes. The tribal organization also would not let their dependents lack for food or a means of livelihood. Fundamental to the Celtic social attitude was the fact that there was no such concept as absolute or private 
ownership of land. It, individual ownership was totally foreign to them as a concept. Agricultural development grew because they functioned as cooperatives of several interested parties. And there were six basic social classes in Celtic society. It was possible for someone to rise as well as fall from one order to another. So not like a caste system where you're stuck. Military service was not a criterion for status. Though the lowest class was called non-freemen, the law system was uniformly averse to slavery. This class was made up of lawbreakers who suffered a loss of civil rights. They didn't have prisons, but they lost their civil rights. The offender had to redeem himself. And this is interesting because later, we're going to see in the Christian practice that penance and restoration was considered important rather than just asking for forgiveness and being absolved. If the offender could not redeem himself, the third generation of that class was freed from all restrictions and granted full citizens' rights again. The chieftains were the highest class, presidents of tribal assemblies, judges in public courts, and commanders of the forces in war. And women could rule as chieftains on their own merits. Uh, the female had a unique place in the Celtic world compared to other civilizations. She was regarded equally and enjoyed equality of rights that would have been envied by their Roman sisters. The Roman bride belonged to her husband and could no longer own her own property. The Celtic bride remained mistress of all she brought into the marital partnership, including her personal dowry. And if the marriage was dissolved by death or divorce, the wife took back her freedom and any acquisitions she had made during the marriage. In parts of the Celtic world, a sophisticated form of polygamy existed in which man and woman had equal rights. The professional class, the second highest class, were the druids, bards, lawyers, and doctors. And once Christianity began to spread, the druids became the Christian priests, and the bards became the scribal monks. Closely associated with this class was a professional class, well-trained and highly regarded in society, of poets, storytellers, and minstrels. They were avid in their pursuit of knowledge, literacy, and learning. And this group was the repository of Celtic folklore, legends, history, and poetry. And music was quite popular among the Celts, using a variety of instruments, including lyres, drums, pipes, trumpets, and a harp-like instrument. And to this day, the harp is the national um, symbol for Ireland. In the early Christian times, all of Britain and Ireland were culturally, at least, Celtic. Um, as I said, it was tribal, based on the principles of loyalty to kith and kin in extended family groupings. There was a rural society devoted to stewardship of the land and deeply sensitive to the natural world. They did not have towns, nor currency, but a deep devotion to learning and a belief that knowledge should be passed orally from one generation to another or from one tribe to another if it was to be understood. Their riches were spiritual and intellectual. Their existence challenges the belief that civilization and some degree of poverty cannot exist together a belief today that has caused the ruination of much of the poor south of the world, which has a similar culture. So Ireland must be the starting point for any Celtic 
spiritual investigation because this is the country that was beyond the confines and the compromises of Roman imperialism. When the rest of Europe was plunged into the dark ages, the light of Christian faith shone brightly on the very edge of the Atlantic, where Ireland was experiencing her golden age of unsurpassed spiritual beauty. There's a wonderful book I recommend to you, How Ireland Saved the World. <laughs> Christianity was assimilated into Celtic life with comparative ease for some of the reasons I've already shared with you. There's hardly any evidence of fierce opposition or harm done to missionaries. And we're talking about the early days. Later on, we'll see that monks and missionaries were slaughtered, but by the Vikings, not by the people that the missionaries were bringing Christian faith to. So rather than a clash of beliefs, the Druids and Bards, who already had the doctrine of immortality, of a world soul, of the mysticism of the Trinity, simply absorbed the new philosophy and created a new brand of Christianity, which became the basis for the Celtic Church. As church and state in the Roman Empire got married after the toleration edict of 312 BC, heroic virtue was exchanged for compromise with the world. We're talking about continental Christianity. And the inevitable result was insipid mediocrity. So men and women finding no challenge or call to self-sacrifice in the cities began to flock to the desert where they had a bold encounter with the realities of existence, a challenge to all accepted norms in society, a facing of the shadow side of the human personality, and ultimately a confrontation with evil. So the Desert Fathers, and we bring them in here because we'll see that arc that I talked about, the east side was into Galatia, and the influence of the Desert Fathers and Mothers was part of the influence in Celtic Christianity as well. So asceticism, oh, the Desert Fathers were essentially solitaires, um, expressing their love for their neighbors by self-sacrifice, continuous prayer, and handcraft work for the poor. Their lives reveal extraordinary humility, gentleness, tenderness, sensitivity, and compassion. And harmony with the creator meant harmony with all of creation. As they were living in these harsh, this harsh environment, they also befriended their environment. Ascetic monasticism began to spread from the deserts and shake up the church in Rome. Saint Martin of Tours was a major figure in this development as he bore a no compromise witness to Christian simplicity in the worldly church of Gaul. By this time, bishops had become civil servants and donned in imperial purple. St. Martin's unkempt monks lived by a rhythm of complete withdrawal for solitary prayer, alternating with intense missionary activity. They may have looked like hippies, but it was they who were evangelizing the rural tribes. And this rural model of ascetic piety was one that took root in Ireland becoming to all intents and purposes the church of that island. The continental model of diocesan episcopacy or hierarchy did not transplant into the purely rural setting. So in Ireland, we might find in each tribal area two kinds of leaders. One was the chiefs in which the uh, Warriors sang and caroused 
with whom the warriors sang and caroused, and the other would have been the abbots, um, with whom soldiers of Christ sang psalms and hymns and were nourished by the body and blood of Christ. The larger monasteries were called cities, attached to the community of monks, and the, the monastery's membership could be men and women in the same monastery, could be married and single in the same monastery. Give, a given monastery may have its own particular rules of life, but they, the, there were large numbers of families who lived around the monasteries um, and students of the monasteries who formed Europe's prototype universities. But every monastery, whether it was large or small, was called a mintir, M-U-I-N-N-T-I-R, which means people, thus emphasizing the human family aspect of the establishment. It was not the place or district which mattered, as much as the human community dimension. And monastic rules were not a series of regulations, but rather emphasized the spirit which should animate the community life. For example, quote, these are thy three rules. There's the Trinity again. Have thou patience, humility, and the love of the Lord in thy heart. Each person was responsible to an anamkara, or soul friend. The closest thing we might have today to that might be a spiritual director, um, which has never been I think a good name for what a spiritual director actually is because they don't, I'm a spiritual director, we don't, when we meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, we do not direct them, but rather hold up a mirror and try to help them see how God is moving in their own life. Now an Anamkara might have a little stronger role in assessing the spiritual health of their soul friend and recommending particular practices or if a penance was needed, how the penance would be um, worked through. But it, see how relationship or community was really in the fabric of how they practiced their faith. So um, they had an a strong, rigorously biblical, but a strong emphasis on redemption, forgiveness, and salvation through Christ. And it was the Irish who first introduced private confession to the whole church. And their penitentials became famous. The Abba or Abbot presided over a collection of people, each of whom was expected to follow their own particular vocation in strict obedience to their anamkara. We'll come back to that, um, you know, with John Calvin and our particular heritage, such a strong emphasis that everyone is a minister, everyone has a calling, everyone has a vocation, but you find it here in the Celtic roots as well. The Celts don't have any tradition in architecture. In fact, I was listening to a Celtic scholar recently and he said, even today in Ireland, you will not find a building higher than 17 floors. <laughs> they don't have skyscrapers. Most of their structures were low to the ground. And when they worshiped, we think they probably worshiped outside more than inside. And you find, if you go to iron, uh, Iona today or other parts of Ireland and Scotland, you may find these huge, on, well, on your handout in the back of one of them is um, one with art. I think we ran out of enough handouts. 
with the one that had art on the back. Um, there's, there are two. Oh. So. Yeah, and we didn't have enough for everybody for some reason. Um, you see these tall, you can't really get the scale of them very well, but um, the bottom corner are these very tall stone crosses with the orb in the center. And we'll get to this some more later, but engraved beautifully with lots of animals and uh, shapes. You can see the one is in front of the abbey in Iona, and that will give you a bit of a sense of scale. It's probably about eight feet tall, I would say. Thank you. So not known for their architecture, um, but the, in their religious art, uh, they, well, we know from the Book of Kells, which was a manuscript of the scriptures that was scrolled, scribed by Celtic monks, although they may not have identified themselves as Celts at the time. But some believe that the Book of Kells was written, developed, on the island of Iona. And if, if you ever have a chance to go to Trinity College in Dublin and see it, they only show a couple pages, but then they, they also um, of the actual Book of Kells to protect it. But you can see its designs on walls around it. They, they would take a capital letter and add little animals or little designs or little flourishes throughout the whole book. Just beautiful. So that's how they expressed their art, as well as these erected standing stones. And they, the standing crosses or standing stones would symbolize a link between earth and heaven. Um, there's a lot of metalwork also in Celtic, um, ancient Celtic times. And you can see there's some beautiful chalices and other things that have been made. Um, when, you, when you get to things like the Book of Kells, it's almost as if they, you, it gives the impression their th thrill over the, the gospel could not be contained in mere letters. <laughs> this one author said, they seem, the scribes seem to have become intoxicated with joy, expressing this in fantastic designs bursting over the pages in every color of the rainbow. Um, let's see, what else? I think I want to move on. <coughs> yeah, so maybe we'll, we'll stop there. Um, well, we're going to end the class in 10 minutes. Somebody have a question? I have a question. But I don't know. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned the, I guess it's the father and the people. There was a certain reluctance to commit things to Brett Wright to keep their own position. Was there any reason behind why they were afraid of you? That they like, used in other ways? Or, or was there experience with putting something in writing and getting killed? I was just wondering what created the reluctance. I don't, I don't know. She, she's asked what created the reluctance of the Celtic people to, to primarily use an oral tradition instead of written tradition. And the question reminds me a little bit about when a Catholic, Roman Catholic confirmation class came to worship, not here, but at another church I was serving. And afterwards they asked me, why don't you honor Mary? And my question, would have been to them, why do you honor Mary? <laughs> because I, it, it, I think the Celts would say, what do you mean, why did we have an oral tradition? It's like, do you think the written tradition is better? So I don't know that there was a hesitance, see, as much as that was their culture.
Yes. Well, no, we're talking about a time when people could have read and written, but the early prayers and poetry were passed down uh, orally. There, there was later a time, and unfortunately it was through the Reformation, when written Gaelic literature and the language was expunged. And so thank goodness there had been some oral tradition or we would have lost even more. Yeah, I was just going to mention all of the Celtic symbolism in our sanctuary here at Fourth Church. If you study the ornamentation on, up in the chancel uh, along the woodwork, you see that uh, triple interlinked design that Vicki's talking about. And of course our cross up in the front has the circular uh, design reminiscent of the Celtic crosses. Uh -huh. So you see that you know, everywhere, really. Right. And a friend I was with yesterday said, oh, you should go to St. Patrick's Church yes. on Adams and Desplaines because you'll see this Celtic art all over the place. And let me just say a word and then we'll take another question. If there, this intertwining, which is so typical, um, is, is to convey how in, intertwined, united, uh, and non-dualistic their worldview was. So heaven and earth, time and eternity, life and death, humanity and creatures, rocks and trees, light and darkness. The spiral is maybe one of the most prominent features as well as these interlocking knots. Okay. Other questions? All right, over here. Hi, I don't want to say the wrong thing about Taze, but I would be interested in knowing when Taze became used a lot. Um, okay, so Taze is the name of a community in France and contemporary to us, to our generation, a Catholic um, community of brothers began writing music and having ecumenical public worship services to which young people in the hundreds have thronged. But that's not Celtic. Okay. It's um, grew out of a Catholic community. You pr it probably comes to mind because the, as the abbey in Iona, in their, the Iona worship community, right. uses Teze music as they do other music from around the whole world, and, as well as they have developed some of their own music. Oh, so theology comes next week and the week after? Yeah. Because uh, I'm curious, uh, this has been fascinating, explains a lot about why the Irish talk so much. <laughs> the oral tradition. Anyway, and are such great storytellers. Yeah. So, but the uh, theology of um, incarnation, resurrection, salvation, the salvation theology is what... I'm interested in. So that's next week. Oh, I don't want you to talk about it if it's next week. I can wait. So next week we're going to, um, we didn't get to all of your handouts, for which I apologize. And I would suggest you, you bring them back with you next week or leave them at the back table and pick them up next week. Either way. But um, we will, Pelagius was one of the first and foremost theologians in the Celtic world and he was regarded a heretic. So we'll have a lot of fun talking about what was lost when he was determined to be a heretic. And that gets into some of that salvation theology. 
And John Philip Newell is a contemporary theologian who uh, bashes substitutionary atonement. So that will be really fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so until next week. Until next week. Let me, um, let me close with a benediction, which you may have heard from our own Scottish uh, bard, um, Callum MacLeod, but comes from the Celtic world. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the gentle night to you, moon and stars, pouring their healing light on you. Deep peace of Christ. Christ, the light of the world to you, deep peace of Christ to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>